So when I looked at my calendar um, for these first three or four months of this year, um, after I was diagnosed with cancer in uh, December and knew I'd be in chemotherapy, I, um, after a little bit of pressure from my husband and family, I basically canceled all my speaking engagements. Um, and I've been making videos instead. However, I looked at this one, and there were two very important reasons why I thought I could hold on to this one. Um, one was Margaret. The other was that for the whole of my academic career, which has been the last 20 years here in Canada, but before that in the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Hong Kong, um, I have worked with the clinics. And I have a special place in my heart for the clinics within law school. That was what I did my doctoral research on, believe it or not, many, many decades ago. Um, and so I'm really happy to be here today. I think you've got a fabulous collection of people who I hope can work in a very practical way on these enormously complicated issues today. There are no easy answers. If someone tells you there's a solution, they're, they're not telling you the truth. There is no one solution here. It's complex. But I echo the words of my colleague, Doug Ferguson, we really have to get going on this. So um, I just want to start with a very quick little anecdote. And I have to put these on because I can't see otherwise. Um, some of you may know about the National Self-Represented Litigants Project. This is our website and Facebook and Twitter. Um, I have been introduced to the joys of Twitter um, by my project manager, Sue Rice, who some of you know who is um, basically our tweeter. I'm not allowed to live tweet. Um, I get usually told off when I do that because I might say something inappropriate. So uh, she usually sort of sanitizes it. But very now and again, I let myself do that, just occasionally, just as a special treat. Um, I also know, as those of you in the room who are familiar with Twitter, that one of the golden rules of Twitter is do not get into a Twitter war with someone. Am I right? Like, don't piss back and forth. Like, forget it. So, OK, I'm going to declare to you that I broke this rule yesterday. So I received the following, shall be nameless, um, on Twitter. Um, Cannot duplicate the benefits of counsel equals unrepresented. Now, first of all, let me say I agree that self-represented litigants, and they would tell you this themselves, are not duplicating the benefits of counsel. But what I do know from working with this community, and many of you will know this too, is the word un is like saying they're not there at all. And the word self is at least a way of identifying them as trying to do the best they can in that role. So I broke my rule, and I tweeted back. Um, cannot duplicate benefits of counsel, but not invisible or irrelevant equals self-represented. So this morning, my alarm went off at 5.30, and I had a few moments of thinking, why was it exactly I said I was going to do this this morning? But then I looked at my Twitter feed, and I read this. Respectfully, this is from the person who had originally tweeted, Respectfully, and as soon as you see the word respectfully, you know there's a problem, right? As soon as you see that. Respectfully, they are invisible and practically irrelevant. It's a convenient fiction. Well, I want to thank that individual for giving me a reason to get up this morning. Because with that, I got out of bed and came here, because I think that it is extremely important that we continue to talk about the fact that self-represented litigants are relevant. They are inconvenient. They are sometimes, putting it bluntly, a pain in the ass for the people who have to work opposite them, the judges who have to hear from them. They are a huge complexity in the way that everybody here does their job. But they are most certainly neither invisible nor irrelevant. And I think we have to start with that premise in mind. So what I'm going to do in the next half an hour or so, because I want some time for questions here, is I'm just going to take you through some of the results of our study. Now, I want to say, first of all, that Marion Overholt could come and do this talk, because she's heard it so many times. <laughs> um, but I hope that for those of you who haven't necessarily gone to the website and read the complete research report, this will give you some additional insight uh, into what we found in the study that we conducted 
in 2011 to 2013 here in Ontario, British Columbia, and Alberta. So this is data from across the country. And please come in and sit down. Don't worry about it. So first of all, just to make sure we're on the same page, the numbers. You're fairly safe in saying that a majority of litigants in family court now in our larger urban centers are going to be there without counsel. Uh, the numbers bobble around depending on which court you look at, which jurisdiction. But in the larger centers, these numbers are all 50% plus. In other words, there are more people in family court now without a lawyer than with one, which is astounding when you think about it. The numbers in Ontario are currently collected at the time of filing. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about that is we know from my study that, in fact, a lot of people, and from common sense, lose their counsel between filing and appearing. So those numbers are probably an underestimate. And just to give you an idea, downtown Toronto now, Jarvis, 78% at filing are unrepresented. Now, you may come from a smaller court or a smaller place, and you don't see these numbers this high, but all I can say to you is they're going up and they're going to keep going up. Uh, a figure from the late 1990s, and I think this one is very interesting because, of course, this period of time, 95 to 99, is the same period of time that we saw dramatic decline in public assistance. Self-reps went up 500% across the unified family courts. And then we often use California as a benchmark in justice system research because they are the largest jurisdiction in North America. Unfortunately, whenever I give them as an example with Canadian audiences, people always roll their eyes and say, oh, that's California. Um, but if we can get away from that stereotype, they provide us with a very good source of quantitative data because of being the largest single volume jurisdiction. So this is how the numbers have changed. In 1971, 1%. In 1992, 46%. In 2077%, and now it's over 80%. So you can see how this has been going up exponentially. And when I first thought about doing this research project, it was because I was kind of browsing in a lackadaisical fashion on the federal courts uh, center's we uh, website in the United States because they have a lot of very interesting research they bring out continuously. And I started to read some reports about the volume of self-represented litigants, and I kept thinking, this must be a typographical error. I'll read another report. And I kept coming across the same number over and over again. So you heard Margaret say that uh, I, am the, <laughs> I am the head of the National Self-Represented Litigants Project. The National Self-Represented Litigants Project is myself and Sue Rice. I mean, we're not exactly a huge organization. Um, we just do the work of about 40 people. Um, and this is what we're doing in order to keep um, the momentum established by the original research. This was not my plan. I thought I would write a book and move on to something else. But because of the amount of interest generated and the amount of work there seems to be to do, we continued. Um, we are still doing pieces of research and consulting in the United States now. Uh, there is a research project which is duplicating my methodology being started in four United States states. Uh, and we're consulting to them because they haven't got this data yet either. Um, we develop resources, mostly for self-represented litigants. Uh, if you follow us, you'll see we just brought out the Canley Primer yesterday, which was months of work, um, but we hope will help self-reps to find their way around Canley. And we also convene dialogues. So we work to bring together leaders from the law societies, the legal aid boards, and other groups as well to try to have a conversation with one another to share best practices, share challenges and information, and just try to join the dots amongst the various efforts that are going on across the country. So, I did 283 interviews with 259 self-reps in family and civil. These are the demographics, just quickly. 60% um, of my study was from family courts. So this is a study that is you know, pretty much two-thirds of the respondents were in family court. 50% um, had a university degree, you know, which I think tells you something right away about this population. We're not just talking about the very vulnerable, the lower educated, the very poor. Now, we are talking about those people, 
but we are also talking about people with a university degree, and we are also talking about people, in some cases, who have a reasonably good income. And one of the reasons that we see those people with reasonably good incomes doing this um, is because they have already, in many cases, and I'll come to this in a moment, expended a great deal of money on counsel and feel that they simply can't continue to go on paying. So we have a far more diverse group here now representing themselves than we've ever had before. So I also did 107 interviews with service providers because they were, I felt, really close to what was happening, close to the action, and there was a very consistent response from those service providers and from the SRLs when I asked the same questions. For example, um, what do you think is the greatest challenge for SRLs? I got very consistent answers from both the self-reps themselves and from the service providers. What do you think are people's misplaced expectations going into this? Because a lot of people dramatically underestimate how difficult it's going to be. Again, very similar answers. So it was a useful point of triangulation if you're into all that research method stuff, and that's why I did it. Um, we then held a stakeholder forum in which we brought together 60 people to talk about the results of the study. We had 45 people from the justice system uh, from the three provinces in which I'd done the work. Judges, law society leaders, legal aid board uh, managers, uh, policy makers from the justice ministries, lawyers. We also had 15 self-represented litigants, five from each province. Uh, that was the hardest fundraising I have ever done to get the money to get those people there. You can't imagine how many times I was told, can't you just Skype them in for half an hour? No, I want them to be part of the process of talking. And this has become a very important theme in the work that we do. Uh, it was an amazing event. Um, there's a report on the website if you want to read it. It was actually a very moving event, I think, for everybody who took part in it. And then we came out with the report and the 10 action steps. If you um, have picked up a bookmark, you'll see that the 10 action steps, which came directly from the research findings, are on those bookmarks. Uh, so feel free to take them home with you, leave them somewhere else for somewhere else to pick up. Uh, and we have been working through those action steps in our um, research, in our resource development, in our social media work, and so forth. So, this is the big question, and I have a feeling with this audience, I don't need to spend too much time on this, but believe me, when I talk to some groups, I still have to spend a lot of time answering this question, because it's crazy, right? You're not trained to be a lawyer, you're already going through uh, a transition in your life that's a very difficult one, chances are. And now, on top of all of that, you want to represent yourself. Why? Well, that's the stereotype. And, you know, it's interesting how incredibly pernicious this stereotype is. Now, if you think back to the first slide where I told you that in 1971 in California, 1% of people were self-representing. In 1971, I suspect that some of the 1% might have looked a little like that because they were really the outliers. And what we have to start changing our thinking about is that these folks aren't the outliers any longer. They are not the outliers any longer, and the most important reason that they're doing this is limited legal aid, as we know, affordability. They either have no resources, or they have depleted their resources, or they are beginning to think 20, 30, $50,000 into their family case, I am not going to spend any more on this. There must be a way of stopping the bleeding. You know, people told me over and over again, it was either represent myself now or forget my kid's college fund. I'd already blown through half of it. I didn't want to blow through the other half of it. There is also out there in the data that I collected and in previous studies that I've done as well, a disillusionment that's beginning with the way in which the traditional advocacy model works. The idea that there is constantly a standoff, there is constantly polarization, and there is often, to be frank, escalation. And so that comes through as well in people's dissatisfaction. Now, you know, I'm sure you'll talk about this today, self-represented litigants aren't the greatest people at settling their cases. Well, you know, 
That's probably because no one's ever taught them how to negotiate or participate in a mediation and feel confident going up, for example, if there's a lawyer on the other side. But the legal profession still doesn't show its expertise as thoroughly as it ought to do in this area either. We're still on a learning curve, and that does lead to some of this disillusionment. Access to the World Wide Web may be the most important single reason. You know, when my parents um, were my age, if they had ever had to go to court for anything, which they didn't, thank goodness, uh, you know, they were middle class Brits, I'm sure that they would have basically sold their entire possessions, probably also the children, in order to pay for a lawyer. They would not have dreamt of walking into a courtroom on their own. It was a different time. And it's not that self-represented litigants now all think that they're Perry Mason. I mean, they don't wake up in the morning and think, oh, I feel like being a lawyer. They don't have the resources to be able to continue or to hire counsel, first of all, or they don't qualify for legal aid. And they go and type something into Google. And what happens? They get all this massive material. It looks good. It looks good. And people tell me this over and over again. It looked like there was so much online. I have a university degree. I have a college education. Surely I can do this. And that seduction of the World Wide Web and all that it means in terms of self-help culture is a hugely important factor here. Just to tell you a quick story. Um, one of the courthouses I worked at in, in rural Alberta, uh, I got the court staff together one morning to start to talk to them about the project. And um, as you often see in these courthouses, there was kind of an older generation and a younger generation of court staff. And they were sitting around a table kind of facing each other. They were all women, I also have to say. And an argument started to develop between them over those self-represented litigants who drive a great big SUV into the parking lot and then come to the window and say, I'm filing self-represented because I can't afford a lawyer. Now, I'm sure most of you know how this story panned out. The older ladies said, I think that's ridiculous. They should sell the SUV. And the younger women started to laugh. Why would anybody, you seriously imagine anyone of my generation would sell their car to get a lawyer? And the older ladies are quite sensibly saying, well, yes, because they would, not this generation. And that's what we've got to keep reminding ourselves. This is not just everybody suddenly hates lawyers. This is a whole different valuation of what it means to get professional services. And that's happening in all areas of professional expertise, not just in law. So the affordability puzzle. And I, I developed this graphic and try to explain this a little bit more thoroughly because I think it's very difficult not to get sucked into this idea of there's an objective measurement of what people can afford. But the reality that is that isn't really what happens. They make their own subjective assessments. So these are the factors. Legal costs, insufficient resources, the perceived value of legal services. You know, a lot of the people I interviewed didn't feel like they were getting value for money. Now, they may have been, but we are woefully bad at explaining what that is when we deliver legal services. We're still in this mindset of, we know best, and we don't really have to explain it to you. We just know that this is good. You know, we have to start changing that as well so that people know what it is they're buying. Because I believe that counsel adds enormous value. I believe that you cannot duplicate counsel as a self-represented litigant, but we have to convince people. We can't just say, trust us, it's true. We have to do a bit more than that now. And finally, the self-help culture. Uh, there's this uh, phenomenon that sociologists call the disintermediation phenomenon. They always have great names for things, don't they? And basically what it means is we are trying in the 21st century to increasingly cut out the middle person in our purchase of services. So disintermediation is why people put their own lawn signs out saying for sale by vendor. Or why, and this always frightens me, they go online and invest their own stocks and shares. Well, disintermediation is happening in law too. And that's one of the reasons, again, why people are not using lawyers. They don't see them as worthwhile for them or they simply can't afford them in the first place. Now, this was not a statistic that I was expecting out of the study. 53% of my sample 
had had counsel before. This was completely unexpected. But they had run out of funds, they had run out of willingness to pay, and I have data on how much they spent, and some of them spent like horrifying amounts of money that for everybody in this room would be a lot of money. I had six lawyer self-reps in my study, by the way. Six lawyers who were representing themselves because they couldn't afford a lawyer. They were very interesting. Or people who became ineligible for legal aid, having been legally aided to begin with. Others cannot even afford to get started. And this is a classic quote. It's not that I think that I can do this better than a lawyer. I have no choice. I don't have $350 an hour, dollars an hour to pay a lawyer. One of the things that self-represented litigants often complain about is that in the right-hand bottom corner of every form they ever complete in Ontario, it says words to the effect of, you really ought to get a lawyer. You really ought to get a lawyer. And they hear it from the bench. You really ought to get a lawyer. Now, it's true, but if you can't afford it and you don't qualify for legal aid, it starts to get a little aggravating to be told you ought all the time. It's a catch-22. You can't afford to hire a lawyer, but the courts don't want you to represent yourself and you can't qualify for legal aid. I'm going to play you a very short little piece of video now uh, from somebody who ha was interviewed in the original study, just a little clip. Uh, there you go. People wanted to be self-reps. Well, I suppose there are always some. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. There will be the outliers of every population of people who are My experience with myself and the research that Dr. McFarlane and others have done is clear. But I didn't want to be representing myself. When I had to, I naively thought that I probably could. <coughs> it's not true. Uh, I'm more concerned actually with the less resource but there's, a, there's another group. There's the people who can't afford the lawyer and have no academic or other resources to be able to function as SRO. The idea that people would really want to get into this is damn near destroyed me. And I'm one of the strongest people who want to be sorry to be vulnerable. But I have resources that most people could barely manage. In terms of social support structures, I have stable income, etc. And we want to get in this okay. If we do, then make it quickly. Don't do it. Uh, that's a country minister from Essex, Ontario, uh, who represented himself in a divorce. So, what do self-represented litigants want from lawyers? Let's get down to the concrete, what can we do, what are they asking for? Not to say that necessarily everything self-represented litigants want is what we need to be providing, but I think this is at least a very important place to start, and this is why I did this research. They want them to work with them as partners, not just telling them what to do. Uh, and this came up constantly in the data. For those 53%, who had already paid for legal services, they didn't feel like they were really being um, participants in their case, and a lot of their complaints were about not knowing what it was that was happening, not feeling like they were really engaged in the decision-making process, not even knowing what some of the decisions might be that were going on. Um, and so this analogy of coaches started to come up, uh, which is one that we have tried to develop in some of the work we're doing now at the project, thinking about a lawyer as a coach who helps people to take the next steps, rather than the full-on representation completely in charge model. Now, that's not going to work for everybody. You know, there is no one single type of self-represented litigant, but for at least a number of people, this is a more contemporary version of that very traditional expert-novice relationship that we have become so accustomed to in the legal profession. Oh, I did something wrong. And he's gone. Oh. There we go, okay. 
People need their lawyers to be fully transparent about legal costs so they can make a decision. You know, one of the things that I think is so interesting about this study is it really does show that people are savvy consumers. And they want more information about what they're paying for and why. And then they will make a decision. I mean, there are people out there, hundreds of thousands of people, shopping online every day. They make savvy decisions about what they purchase. If any of you have been following the Walmart law story, um, there's a firm in Toronto that has opened in a couple of Walmart outlets. It's fixed fee. People make savvy decisions, and we need to give them more information to do that. Be frank about the limits and the challenges of litigation. I wrote a blog a couple of weeks ago, which was kind of a riff of something that has just been done um, with medical services in terms of the research that makes patients feel like they are really being taken care of by their doctors. And it was about this concept of alleviating suffering. In other words, you don't just prescribe medicine because it will be good for that person, but you take into account all the other contexts that they are functioning in and what their needs might be. And in the same way, Clients want to know what are going to be the challenges, what are the limits. They frequently have higher expectations than their lawyers can actually meet, and we need to start getting a lot more honest about that as well. Take settlements seriously. There's plenty of stories in my report about clients who felt that the lawyers were not really taking the possibility of advancing settlements seriously. You know, we've been saying this for 20 years now, since I first talked to Margaret. Uh, but we need to keep at this. What else? One of the things that I found especially fascinating was talking to the people who had had some kind of summary advice, either because they had been working with duty counsel or possibly because they had that free consultation that is basically summary advice, or they had been to a local clinic and had a 45-minute interview, whatever it might be. And here's what used to happen consistently in these stories. People would be very excited that they were getting a session. They were going to get a free consult. They were going to go to the community clinic. They were going to see duty counsel next Wednesday. And then afterwards, they were disappointed. And they weren't just disappointed. They were often upset. Because what happened in that summary advice session, because this is what we've been trained to do, was that the lawyer would give them 45 minutes of very fast talk, here's the strengths, here's the weaknesses, this is what might happen in your case, blah, 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 all of that substantive appraisal without actually telling them what they had to do next. Because that summary advice model was developed 30 years ago, really, in order to help people decide whether to bring forward a case with a lawyer. That was always the assumption. Now what's happening is that people who access that model, whether it's at your clinic, duty counsel, or even if you're a private lawyer, they're accessing that model in order to decide whether they will take the case forward. And this is a fundamental change in how we need to think about how that 45 minutes gets used. Yes, it's going to need some substantive appraisal, but it's also going to need how to take the next steps. And that tweak I think is one of the most significant tweaks that we could start taking seriously in the way that we offer that model. Except that they may want to and be able to handle parts of the case themselves. This is the unbundling um, model, which is still uh, extremely minimally used uh, by the legal profession. The insurers are on board, the law societies, at least in principle, are on board. But what I found was that virtually everybody I interviewed looked for unbundling. They didn't call it that, but that's what they were looking for. You know, could you go over my documents for two hours? Could you spend an hour with me getting ready for my hearing next week? And for reasons that we all know, and are good reasons, lawyers don't like doing that. Now, I'm not trying to minimize how much they don't like doing it, or the reasons they don't like doing it, and the fact that it's a huge sea change. But you know what? If the whole population is asking us to do it, sooner or later we have to do something about that. People don't understand. Why can't I go to a lawyer and get three hours of advice? There is a pervasive myth, and it is a myth, that if you offer unbundling, you'll get sued. Well, I've checked this out with the law societies, and insofar as they keep figures that distinguish between complaints for full representation and limited scope retainers, there is no difference. In fact, you see fewer complaints for limited scope retainers, even given the volume, 
because people just want a leg up. They are savvy consumers. They can understand you can write a limited scope retainer that makes it clear what you can do. So we, I think, have to take this more seriously. A few other things for people in the room who are interested in what non-lawyers can do, because this is a very important part of this. Document checking. I imagine that uh, my friends from the bench here know what happens when a self-rep gets before them and you find that there is something missing or wrong with their documentation. It's enormously frustrating for everybody, including the self-rep, but not just the self-rep. Hearings representation. This is the single thing that self-represented litigants want the most. Now, at the moment, you can only represent somebody if you're called to the bar. There is increasing interest in the model of McKenzie Friends, which wouldn't allow people to be spoken for, but they could at least sit with them, keep them focused, get them organized, and so forth. More assistance with procedural issues. You know, uh, it's a little ironic because we've just brought out this Canley primer yesterday. Almost every single person I interviewed told me that they use Canley. And in fact, they spent less time telling me they needed help with Canley, although we just gave it to them yesterday, than they did saying they needed help with this. They needed help with procedural information. And this was, again, something I didn't expect to hear. Now, I'm not saying that all these self-reps went to Canley and produced a brilliant legal argument. I mean, they probably thought they did, but I can't possibly judge that. But what I can tell you is that it's the procedural pieces that distress them the most. The procedural pieces they get most confused about and most anxious about and, and at the end of the day, most negative about when Doug talked about losing faith in the justice system. We could help people with that procedural information using law students. We could help them using legal information staff in the courthouse. We could help them using court staff if court staff have a clearer idea of what they can do that is not legal advice. And we've been working with a couple of provinces on that very issue. Quite a lot of these folks also said they wanted orientation. Like they wanted an opportunity when they first filed to go to a seminar, which would not talk to them about the technicalities of their case, not procedural, not substantive, but it would tell them what to expect. And these are seminars at which maybe it would be good to have other self-represented, former self-represented litigants speaking to explain. This is an incredibly difficult process. You need to understand what you're getting yourself into. Now, people are still going to do it. You know, if you're facing losing access to your kid and you can't afford a lawyer, you're not going to give up at that point. But at least people would have a better idea of what's ahead of them and some of the cultural barriers that they might be going to face. Couple more, emotional support. Uh, I was telling somebody before we started, I think, the associate dean, wherever she's gone, um, that we have a little coaching program at Windsor where we match law students with local self-represented litigants, and the idea is that they help them with their forms, they give them procedural information, they cannot give them legal advice, obviously. But what they found, these students, is that they spent most of their time in Tim Hortons listening to A Tale of Woe. And I cannot tell you the impact that this has on these law students when they realize that actually what clients want from lawyers or people acting in that role is emotional support. It is an incredibly traumatic process to go through this on your own and to feel, as so many self-reps do, incredibly isolated. Um, you know, people told me constantly, no one will even go out for beer with me any longer because all I ever talk about is my case. You know, if you are losing access to your kids and you're representing yourself, it's pretty easy to get obsessed. I mean, who wouldn't, really? And so that emotional support is tremendously, tremendously important. Peer support, and this is the Friends of the Court McKenzie friend idea. Uh, and I would say that this helps people to be more functional, and if it helps people to be more functional, that benefits everybody in the courtroom. And online resources designed and tested by self-represented litigants. We're getting much, much better resources now. They are beginning to be properly developed for people who don't have a legal background. Uh, when I first started doing this work, the resources that people had Googled immediately and felt, oh, there's so much out there to help me, often turned out to be you know, the rules of civil procedure that somebody had just like put on a web page. Well, that's not very useful. We need a lot more than that. And we are now beginning to see that happen. 
Okay. I'm going to stop and take some questions because I want to come to these slides at the very end, but I have a few minutes left and I want to give people an opportunity to raise issues, ask questions as a kind of warm up for your working groups. Hi, I'm, Thank you. I'm Steve Benmore. I'm a lawyer in Toronto. I'm a sole practitioner. I practice family law. I only do family law. Uh, uh, Professor McFarland, thank you for leading the conversation, not just in this room, but throughout Canada on this epidemic. It's really an epidemic uh, that's tantamount to uh, people not being able to access education or health care. Um, it's just certainly not given the same level of attention by government, quite frankly, by the media either. So thank you, and, and I certainly hope the waves of this event spread and continue to spread, so thank you. Uh, my question is, um, and I appreciate everything that you've mentioned, when we look at society and certainly the legal world in Ontario, we have a glut of uh, new professionals entering the field, many of which can't even complete their licensing process because they cannot get articles, because the firms can't afford to offer them articles. We're now dealing with the epidemic of uh, articling students being either not paid or underpaid. We have 47,000 lawyers. We have about another 1,500 to 2,000 coming into the, uh, into the profession every year. A couple hundred that are foreign trade trained coming in from England or Australia, some of whom couldn't get into law school here, so they're going there, coming back here. There's no shortage of legal advice available to the SRLs. When you talk about twenty to thirty thousand dollars as the fee, you are bang on. I can't tell you how much it pains me. I know this sounds inconsistent, but I charge people five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, and it pains me to see them take that money that they have accumulated over the course of thirty, forty years of working to pay a lawyer to get through one or two years of their life. But that's the reality. But I have to tell you that concurrently with that reality is the reality that there are people in this room that could actually change the price tag from 30000 down to maybe three, four, or 5000 So if someone hires me today and says, I want to get to court because my spouse is being unreasonable, they're not letting me see my child or sell my house, or divide my RSP. And they say, what's the price tag to go from where we sit right now? Because I've only paid you $300 right now to get to that place where I can speak to one of the judges and say, can I see my son, or can I sell my house? The answer is in the thousands of dollars. So not on your list is, how can the rules committees of not just Ontario, but of Canada change in a way that allows us to bridge this glut of very eager, hungry lawyers, law students, articling students. How can we bridge them who are prepared to actually get paid $500, $800, $1,000 to be able to bridge them with the SRLs without a system that makes it prohibitively impossible for the lawyer to do what they need to do to give them the access to the justice that they require. Thank you, and um, thank you for being so honest as well. Um, I said at the beginning that there's no one solution to this, um, and what I'm giving you here is just a fragment, obviously. Um, none of this, over the long term, is going to change unless we have massive change to court procedures that enable simplification. Now, we've been talking about simplification of procedures for decades in Canada, and the results are really depressing. You know, we will spend a maximum of 20 days instead of 23 days on discoveries. I mean, this is not simplification of procedures. Um, we know that trial costs are higher and higher and higher than they have ever been, which is why, of course, 95% of cases don't go to trial. So. I believe that there are ways that private legal services can adjust. I think those new lawyers coming out of law school can start thinking about actually marketing themselves to self-represented litigants. They're not going to get retainers and full-on representation, but they are going to get 
$200 an hour, $150 an hour in a limited scope manner. And I do think that people can make a living at that business. But the only way they can do it is if they encourage people to settle. I mean, this is all coming together, I think, in that place, that we need ways to offer simplification if people have to work their way through the courts, but also offer them much more serious efforts to settle. Because, and you know, clients who are self-representing can make those decisions themselves. You know, one of the things that I think is really, uh, has been an interesting conversation we've been having in the last uh, six months or so is, how far would it work for legal aid to give limited certificates? You get 10 hours. You're a self-represented litigant. You can go and spend some of it with you. You can go and spend some of it with some. You can spend that money as you wish, but you know you've only got 10 hours. Now, first of all, that ramps up the incentive to get it done. It ramps up the incentive to settle. And then if we can actually provide settlement processes that lawyers themselves are good and astute at guiding their clients into, then they're going to find a way to get it done in those 10 hours. Not always. Not always. We're still going to have cases that continue. But at least we start to put pressure on the potential for things to be done in a shorter, less expensive, more expeditious period of time. You know, at the moment, the litigation process in family law is like a drug. And I mean, I'm sure you all know this. Once you've, once you've taken it, you just keep taking it over and over again. We have these cases that stay in the system forever. And we don't really have ways of offering people choices to get out. And I think one of the ways, it's only one, one of the ways that private practitioners can help is to start thinking about offering services on a limited basis to self-represented litigants and having them deal with the consequences that they've run out of money. They have to make that decision. They have to make that choice. So what are they going to do now? Are you going to say to them, how about we convene a meeting? How about we try to talk about this? Because at the moment, there's not enough pressure on either the self-reps or the lawyers, in my opinion, to make that happen. Sorry, that was probably much too long an answer, but it's a complicated question. So. Do you see a role for paralegals? I do. I do. I mean, one of the kind of elephants on, in, in the room here is that paralegals can't do family work in Ontario. Um, I think that the Law Society of Upper Canada, which of course is about to have a benches election, needs to be courageous enough to reopen that. Um, it's been kind of off the agenda for a while because it's been so controversial. Um, I actually stood on a platform with the treasurer of the Law Society, the previous treasurer, in Ottawa about a year ago, and a, a, an audience member asked, why can't paralegals do family work in Ontario? And the response was, because we don't think they're ready. Now, you know, you can't tell the public this any longer. You've at least got to have a good reason for it, right? So either there needs to be a really good reason or we need to restrict what family work paralegals do uh, or we need to let paralegals do family work under supervision. I mean, there has to be a way that they can be part of solving this problem. Yeah, I agree. Jennifer? How do self-reps feel about mediation and, and the mediation process and the availability of the services? Yeah, I'm afraid this is pretty depressing. Um, I asked everybody I interviewed about mediation, and of course I knew that in many of the places they were from, they would have been offered mediation. Um, most people can't remember being offered mediation. It's all become such a blur, they can no longer remember. Some people remembered that they'd been given a leaflet, but they didn't know what they'd done with the leaflet. And, you know, a leaflet is clearly not enough here. Uh, and then other people said, I don't want to go to mediation because there's a lawyer on the other side, and I think they'll be much better at mediation than I am. Now, you know, chances are they aren't necessarily. <laughs> However, that is their perception. So one of the things that I think that we need is to take seriously coaching self-represented litigants to do mediation. And that doesn't mean give them a leaflet when they first come into the mediation service, but it means actually spending time with people saying, this is what's going to happen. This is what you need to think about. What's your BATNA? I mean, there are all kinds of tools that we can offer people to enable them to try to participate more effectively. Going back to the paralegals, yeah. I wonder if there's any reason why we're not doing it in medicine that's doing where there's practitioners at the time we made it, but there's always a doctor available. Right. Why wouldn't we have paralegals in the firm in federal law with a lawyer there to make sure they're not outside of the jury? Right. Well, of course, and that's what happens in some parts uh, in other provinces and in, in, the, in parts of the United States as well. Um, it seems to me that there are plenty of models there. There's a new model just started in uh, the US called Limited Legal 
limited legal services technician, I think is the, the word, but basically it's, it's somebody who's a paralegal. And as I said to you earlier, a huge amount of what people need help with is in fact, and this is almost like the big you know, dirty secret that we don't talk about, a huge amount of what people need help with is work that you don't have to be called to the bar to do. It is that work. Yeah. Um, what strikes me though through the process is uh, accounting for the other side and how they react, how they respond, and you know, limiting uh, certificates to 10 hours. I and mean, we can never control how the other side is going to respond, whether they're self represented litigants or they're represented by counsel. And I just wonder in your research um, of the self represented litigants that you interviewed, was there um, any talk of that, and was there a sense that those people you were interviewing had more difficulty with the other side, or because that's that's the ultimate unknown, right? Right. And right. at any given point in the family law process, you can be going along thinking you're going to resolve it, and then all of a sudden they find a new partner, right. and everything right. goes off the rails. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, yeah. I, everything you say is true. But since we know that, I think there are some ways that we can build that in and anticipate it that we don't do at the moment. Um, I think that we can provide a lot more coaching and assistance for people to do that negotiation, to, do, to, to work in those mediations. Again, you know, I think that lawyers could provide that. They could you know, pay for an hour or an hour and a half to go in and work with a lawyer about how will I frame an offer of settlement. I mean, these are not services that we're really offering people at the moment. And I think we have to at least anticipate that and build those kinds of things in. Um, I also think that um, you know, people will use the time as they believe is best. There were some people who managed to get unbundling, very small number in my sample. Um, and they used that time to help them in very particular ways. I mean, they used it very constructively. They couldn't afford full-on representation, so they used what they got. Um, there is a lot of disincentive to escalate in that situation, as I said earlier. So, I mean, what you say is true, but we know that, so we have to build in ways to help us get beyond that, too. Where do you see the role of information referral coordinators and the mandatory information programs in the courts? Because a lot of people who are performing those roles are actually mediators, and in some of the remote courts, lawyers are performing some of those services as well. Right, right. Well, as I say, I think that there's an enormous amount of work that people who are not legally qualified can do. The information coordinators being a really good example of that. Um, one of the things that we saw in my interviews with court staff was that people were constantly anxious about crossing a line in which they would then give legal advice. Um, and one of the things that's grown out of that, I mean, really everything that we do at the NSRLP comes directly out of these research findings, is we have been working, we've been working with Nova Scotia, and we're just about to start in New Brunswick, training court staff on how to distinguish between legal advice and legal information in a very kind of practical, hands-on way. And what we see, because this has been done in the United States as well, and we actually have a US partner on this project, is that once court staff have kind of had the shackles taken off, and they have more confidence and clarity. I mean, this is not a clear, bright line. I'm not saying it is, but it could be clearer than it is. Then they can be tremendously effective in that role, uh, whether or not they are lawyers or, or information referral people. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the other thing I heard constantly about people who work in those roles was that they would often be the people who would be uh, the most empathetic and the most sympathetic. I mean, the other thing you have to realize, and I'm sure many of you do, is that a lot of people who represent themselves experience a lot of hostility when they go into the justice system. I skipped over a slide that said, I was branded a troublemaker you know, from the very beginning. And that was a quote from this incredibly gentle, soft-spoken man who was you know, an artist in British Columbia. It was really hard to imagine him as a troublemaker, but they do experience hostility. But one of the places that I think they feel that they are understood best, and my data shows this, is, is at that level of people doing information uh, and referrals. Yeah. Hi, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are, given the limited pool of public resources to put towards the, the system uh, and sort of driving systems change, uh, your thoughts on investing in early intensive triage information that kind of thing to at least um, sort people into the actual service that's going to benefit them. So the high conflict groups get a particular type of service. The people who can settle 
are directed toward another type of service. And I don't know if your research looked at that, but. Uh, the legal aid growth. Yeah, we're the legal aid growth. <laughs> Um, my research didn't look at triage specifically. Um, I think that there's been a lot of talk about triage, obviously out of Justice Cromwell's National Action Committee, a lot of talk about triage. Uh, it's something that's being written about a great deal. Um, I think that the triage that I would, so I'm not talking from the research now, but, but based on what I know about this, I think the triage that would be the most useful for self-represented litigants would involve that kind of expectation setting that I talked about earlier on. Um, I think that we are still very early on into really being able to figure out whether something at the very beginning is a high conflict case. You know, we're desperate for science, and I have to confess I'm a little skeptical about this. We're desperate for science that says you're a high conflict case, you're a low, low conflict case. As a mediator for the last 25 years, I know I never actually know until I get into the room, you know, what's really going on. So I think that we could do triage that gave, that recognized that people were self-represented litigants, um, understood that that was going to be, you know, their choice at this point, that it might be a choice they would change. Perhaps there are services out there that they could afford if we could start to provide private legal services or even limited legal aid certificates that could give them some help along the way, but at least did some expectations management for them. And I think those are also the places where you could, and you mentioned MIPS, where you could also start to talk to people about the opportunity for trying mediation, thinking about negotiation, and doing that in a much earlier way, absolutely. Now, just, just for the record, and I think Nye knows this well, and I, I don't know, he can tell me he disagrees, but I don't think he does. Um, you know, I want to just say that the way that we're going to solve this problem is not just through public legal assistance. It's just not going to work. You know, it's, there are too many people there's too much need out there for us to be able to ultimately plug this, not just like this little leak in the dam, but this great big gaping hole in the dam now. Um, there's been some very interesting work done by Gillian Hadfield, who's a legal economist uh, in New York State and elsewhere, that shows that if you actually thought about how much it would cost to provide everybody who cannot afford a lawyer, feels they can't afford a lawyer with public legal assistance, it would be way more than any public legal aid system is going to be able to afford. So really important that we direct the limited resources that you have in the right directions. But I think that the private bar needs to get hold of the idea, and I think some of them still don't, that this is not just about more public legal assistance. It's about changing the way that we deliver legal services. Um, the gentleman with the glass, and you just spoke before, right? So let me, get, let, me let Nye, because he's going to disagree with me now. <laughs> not, not in the least. I mean, I'm Nye Thomas. I'm uh, Director General of Policy at Legal Aid Ontario. And I agree with you completely. I mean, the, the landscape is changing a little bit, as you know. Um, Legal Aid has gotten some uh, new money from the provincial government to invest in expanded services, which is a good thing. We expect that uh, the majority of those new resources will be in family law. And we can talk about that um, a little bit later. Um, my question for you really is for the people who don't show up at the courthouse. Mm -hmm. I mean, self-represented litigants, you know, in my world we call it express demand, and needs assessment, you know, vocabulary and stuff. So they've actually gone to the courthouse. Um, they have, they have uh, said that they have a family law problem. They've talked to someone, they've filed an application, whatever it is, they've actually gone to, to the courthouse. One of the distinguishing features between, say, criminal law and family law is that in criminal law, they always know what their demand is. You got a criminal charge, you know there's a legal issue right there. There's a, there's a legal need. Family law, a lot of people don't make it to the courthouse. They, they, they lump it. Uh, they give up. They, they stay married. They stay married. I mean, a very serious issue. Uh, they uh, sign something that, that uh, someone put before them, uh, and they, they you know, never get any advice. Right. Do you have any comments on uh, either the scope of that issue or how to Kind of, kind of make better connections to people who have uh, you know, family law needs uh, that haven't, who should be in the courtroom or in some kind of legal process, maybe that's the better way to put it, but who haven't, uh, haven't, haven't made the trip yet. 
Um, well, first of all, obviously, I have no data because nobody does. We don't know how many people lump it, but we do know. I did a blog a while ago now looking at how the divorce rate is slowly going down and the speculation that that is partly because of the difficulty of going through the legal procedure. So people will split, but they don't necessarily get a divorce because they can't afford to do it. Obviously, that's not possible in a lot of cases. They need that decree and they need the resolution of the issues. Um, I think that until we have the, op the option of a process to enable people to get divorced that does not require them to go through a court system, we are going to have this problem. Um, because at the moment, the only way you can actually get that decree, um, and depending on your jurisdiction, you, know, you might actually have to appear as well, is to file documents at the courthouse. Now, there are countries in which this is an administrative procedure. It's not a legal procedure. Um, and I actually don't think we're ever going to reach that community that you're talking about, where there may be some significant injustices taking place until we think seriously, and I know this is a little radical, I do you know, apologize to my colleagues from the bench here, but in addition to the work you do, that we have an option of an administrative procedure. I don't think we're going to change it otherwise. Let me just, I know I'm out of time, let me just, can I just do my last couple of slides here? So you're going to talk in your groups today about these issues, big issues. So I just want to try to um, give you a few other kind of framing ideas for thinking about this. Um, access to justice in Ontario, as you can see, is the iceberg. So what's underneath the surface of the iceberg? And there is a lot. And I want to just pick on three things, culture, communication, and structure, because I think these are the systemic issues that have to be part of our understanding as we move forward. We've always done it this way. We know best. Well, I mean, we do probably, but that's kind of not the whole answer here at the moment. And there are stereotypes on all sides. I mean, this whole area of research, one of the things that has been so fascinating and challenging is just how pervasive those stereotypes are. And they're not just self-reps are crazy, although that is a very pervasive one. They are also, oh, you know, lawyers are just interested in money, judges are power mad. Um, you know, there are all these stereotypes on all sides, which was why the dialogue event was so incredibly useful and why I believe that the public needs to be involved in these discussions to start breaking down some of those stereotypes. Communication. Of course, we're great at that in the legal profession, right? Lawyers don't explain value and they don't communicate with the public. You know, we've never really talked, I don't think, in Canada about a serious effort at marketing lawyers in language that people would understand and explains their value. So, you know, there are a lot of bruised egos out there amongst lawyers who feel like, oh, self-represented litigants are rejecting us. Well, you know, they're not actually rejecting you. They don't understand what it might be that you could do for them. I asked everybody I interviewed, the last question was, if you could afford a competent lawyer to help you now, what would you like them to do for you? Like one single thing. And although a very, very large majority of them said yes, they would like a lawyer, they couldn't name to me what it would be they would do. They didn't know. That's how poorly we are marketing our services. They didn't know what they could do. Lack of empathy, it's a problem refer you to my Twitter war, which I promise is over now. The inaccessibility of legal language, which is always a problem, we've been working on for years, and lack of system user input. Um, despite the fact that the Cromwell Roadshow was a tremendous initiative, it got a lot of people talking about access to justice, we spent the better part of a year trying to persuade the various regional roadshows to include a self-represented litigant in the discussions. Um, we called it the great roadshow task. <laughs> we got one person into one discussion. There is an enormous resistance to talking to people about their own experiences still. And finally, structure. Complex and bureaucratic court procedures. I mean, the gentleman at the back raised this at the beginning. This is the foundation of the problem here, the reason that you charge $30,000 for a divorce in some cases. We have stalled unified family courts. One third of the province, one third of the province. And how long is it? This was going on when I got here, and that's 23 years ago. So under development of information and dispute resolution services, and I know there's a lot more, but it's still underdeveloped. Family ban for paralegals. 
And then what you're going to do for the rest of today, which is why I think this is such a great opportunity, there is really limited sharing of best practices. And one of the things we try to do at the project is to enable people to exchange those ideas. There are many people doing amazing work, but it's in pockets. And we need to make that a more coordinated response. And people need to be able to have others with whom they can talk about the challenges, because this is incredibly challenging for everybody who works in the family justice system. So thank you very much indeed for having me. You're getting the obligatory uh, gift from Western Law. Mm -hmm. Purple. <laughs> I not only have the privilege of introducing you, I also have the privilege of thanking you. Um, my friend, yes. thank you so much for coming out and spending time with us. You're welcome. Today. Thank you. And I promised everybody that was on the organizing committee that she'd be a thought-provoking first speaker, <laughs> and I think I was correct. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.